Palaroga Shark Media. Hello and welcome to Palace Intrigue. I am your host, Mark Francis. Columnist Diana Elsa, always an entertaining read, got our attention with this headline, No Way Prince William Executes Prince Harry Revenge. Elsa writes for news.com.au, looking at images of Prince William at this week's BAFTA Awards, him all suave in a blue velvet blazer, Richard III's most famous line comes to mind, I can smile and murder whilst I smile. Harry spent tens of thousands of dollars to fly to London for a visit with his father, King Charles, thinking, according to the son, that they would enjoy a meaningful tete-a-tete tucked away at His Majesty's House the Serenity 29-bedroom weekender in Sandringham. Instead, he got awkwardly perched on the edge of a rosewood chaise while he spoke to the king for 30 minutes before having to find himself a hotel room for the night. The Duke flew back to California the next day and then managed to do something largely unprecedented, which was to keep his trap shut, unlike previous instances where details about private family conversations have somehow nearly immediately filtered into the press. This time, what exactly the two men discussed remains a firm secret. When Harry was interviewed by Good Morning America late last week while in Canada with his wife, Meghan, the Duchess of Sussex, to promote the 2025 Invictus Games, he remained equally tight-lipped, a new and strange development. Unlike in 2022, when Harry told the US Today show that he had visited the late Queen to make sure that she's protected and got the right people around her. This time, when asked about his father, Harry simply said, that stays between me and him. Royal expert Jenny Bond says this is a scary time for William. She tells OK Magazine, he's staring his destiny in the face. This is not a time in which he wanted to take on extra responsibilities. And it's not a time when he really wanted to contemplate the fact that one day in the very foreseeable future, he is going to be a monarch. This is a time in his life where he knows he just wants to be a hands-on dad and a very supportive husband. He'll feel somewhat besieged by his wife being ill and now his father having cancer. This is a scary time for him. He's already lost his mother, and I think that gives you a vulnerability with any illness with a parent when you've already lost one. So I really feel for William in this. A source tells the Mirror, whatever has been discussed between William and the King is private, but it is absolutely and categorically clear that William would not allow Harry to return. He thought it was a bad idea at the time, and he's even more clear now. If anyone is going to take on more duties, it will be William, and that isn't even on the agenda for now. His main focus is on his father's health, his family, and what is best for the monarchy. There is a 0% chance Harry is coming back in any capacity. The Mail on Sunday's Sarah Vine wrote, So Harry is right. Such crises can and do have reunifying effects on family. But words are one thing, actions quite another. Harry may say it, but does he mean it? Does he actually understand what reunification entails if his recent actions are anything to go by? No. Words aren't enough. You must show you mean it. You must also understand that sometimes it's not about you, but about the greater good of the family. Royal historian Tessa Dunlop told The Mirror, The problem is that Harry does not belong to any family. The tragic slice of time he was granted with ailing King Charles, despite the air miles and cost, is indicative of the rarefied world the Duke's father occupies, just like his grandmother, the late Queen, who never hugged Harry. Being King aged 75 is a big, distracting gig, especially when you are unwell. Harry probably meant it when he said he was lucky to briefly see his dad, which might explain why the Duke is now on his best behaviour. When asked about the king's condition, he replied, that stays between me and him. Leaky Harry is clearly keen to prove he can be trusted, but is it too little too late? Piers Morgan, writing in The Sun, said, William's always seen the media as the enemy, especially since Diana's tragic death. He's just learned to tolerate and work with us, unlike his hot-headed brother, Harry, who prefers to wage constant hypocritical warfare with journalists for doing the same thing he does to his family week in and week out. And whilst most of my media colleagues share my contempt for the Duke of Netflix over the way he publicly smeared and abused the royals to enrich himself, they also share my huge admiration for William, who's chosen the complete opposite path. I watched him at the BAFTA Awards, flitting amongst the Hollywood greats with supreme ease in the show-must-go-on professionalism, and marveled at how calm and untroubled he appeared to be, despite everything going on behind the scenes in his life. William must be going through considerable private turmoil, but we'd never know it. Unlike his brother, he doesn't play the victim or feel the need to constantly yap to the world about his problems. Instead, he just gets on with things without seeking an ounce of sympathy, and with remarkable dignity and humility, even apologising for belatedly deciding to attend the BAFTAs on his own and for not watching enough of the films due to his wife's illness. 
The concept of a slimmed-down monarchy with far fewer working members was heralded as a great idea when first mooted by Charles when he was Prince of Wales, and we all cheered at the Queen's Platinum Jubilee when the balcony was restricted to the main superstars led by Her Majesty, while the likes of disgraced Prince Andrew and shameful Harry were dumped into unceremonious obscurity. But look how fragile it all suddenly looks now with her sadly gone, her son and heir stricken with cancer and Catherine also out of action. The answer to this crisis is not Harry returning into any part-time working royal action. Is He is clearly so desperate to keep the Sussex's coffers flowing. He's made his treasonous bed in California and can lie in his filthy dollars. No, the answer is William, who's proven to be a wonderful, reliable rock of quiet, determined, dutiful, uncomplaining stability amid all the uncertainty. The Daily Beast quoted friends of Charles as being horrified by Harry's appearance on Good Morning America. One friend reportedly said, It seems Harry has taken it on himself to use the diagnosis to publicise his own agenda. If it wasn't so sickening, it would be funny. What really would have helped the family come together would have been if Harry had said he wouldn't be taking questions about his father. Another is quoted, It's hard to believe that Harry can keep finding ways to make things worse. He just needs to pipe down. Palace Intrigue will be right back. LA-based media finance analyst Mike Rayer believes that Meghan is blowing it by not joining in the suit's spin-off. He told The Express, This could become the costliest decision of her life and one that she may bitterly regret in years to come. The female lead character, a campaigning hotshot lawyer named Erica, was written with Meghan specifically in mind, and there is little doubt she would have been paid many times her original salary. There had been industry talk that she could command as much as half a million dollars per episode. That's the kind of golden shot that even established stars dream of. But she's left everyone dumbfounded by brushing aside what would have been a huge opportunity. The Mayor's Alison Boshoff claimed sources revealed that Netflix will want to get out or scale down further the deal at the earliest contractual opportunity. She added, I'm told by well-placed sources with knowledge of the deal that the association has been disappointing all round, with Harry and Meghan drawing a relatively meagre amount from the streamer, thought to amount as little as $20 million for them personally all in. Royal Observers also note Netflix is not mentioned on the new Sussex website. PR expert Laura Perks has some advice for Megan as she begins her new podcast. Many listeners found her Archetypes podcast too self-absorbed, so this is one of the biggest lessons she can learn from her new podcast deal. One of the reasons why so many people loved her suit's character is because Rachel Zane was so relatable. Although Megan played the character well, the reality was very different to what she portrayed on the show. For public perception to change, I think she needs to bring the softer side of Megan out so that we can get a glimpse of the real person, not the polished facade of a Duchess and Hollywood star. And there you have it. If you'd like to email us, our address is thepalaceintrigue at gmail.com. Please follow us on Spotify, Apple, or your app of choice. If you like the show, hit those five stars. It really helps us out. Hey, if you don't like the show, hit one star. We'll read those two. I'm Mark Francis. My thanks to John McDermott. This is Palace Intrigue. Good times. Mm-hmm.